You prepared your kids for their first steps. The first day at school, their first dance, that big test, all the wins along the way. With a College Savings Iowa 529 plan, you'll prepare them for even more. Register before May 31st for a chance to win a $1,000 contribution. Visit collegesavingsiowa.com to make the first move toward a bright future. College Savings Iowa. It's how parents get through college. Administered by the State Treasurer of Iowa. This episode of the DLU podcast is brought to you by Goalie Nutrition. As someone who's used Goalie for quite some time, I can tell you that they're not only very good, but they're very beneficial. My favorite are the Super Green Gummies. The Super Green Gummies are uniquely crafted with a spectrum of essential nutrients such as vitamins A, B12, folic acid, and theamine. It supports a healthy liver function, healthy nervous and immune system, digestive health, a boost to your metabolism, and overall health and well-being. There are no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or colors from artificial sources. They're vegan-friendly, gluten-free, and gelatin-free. All loyal listeners of the DLU podcast get a special 10% discount at checkout. Go to Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. That's Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. This podcast is a Believe Network and Luciete production. Welcome to another edition of the d Podcast, brought to you by Believe Network. I'm your host, Derek T. Lewis, and I want to take the time for all of you that are listening to this show, everyone on social media that reached out to me. I appreciate your congratulatory messages more than you ever know. You know, that we've uh, made this transition, this move official, you know, with Believe Network, and I am ecstatic about the endless possibilities that I will have with this venture, with Believe. And again, trusting in me that I can definitely deliver, you know, with, you know, bringing you quality content every single Thursday, every single week. But this week, I have a 23 and a half year veteran of the wrestling ring. And um, I came across this guy about 11 years ago when I went to an ECWA event for the Super 8. They have an annual um, tournament called the Super 8, which I'm going to be ring announcing for ECWA on March the 25th. And... The Greek god Papa Don was the ECWA champion at the time, and he also won the tournament. And it was a huge honor for him, you know, to to win that tournament, as you as you'll hear in this interview. He has very strong opinions about his own career as well as the industry as a whole. And again, it was an honor and a privilege to have Papa Don on the show to talk about everything regarding the wrestling business and really took a deep dive in a lot of different topics. But let's not wait any longer. My interview with the Greek god Papa Don starts right now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to have this individual on the DLU podcast. He is a 23 and a half year veteran of the wrestling ring, the Greek god Papa Don. How you doing, man? I am doing well. Thank you for having me on this extraordinary podcast of yours. I'm honored. Thank you. Uh, Like I said, pleasure's all mine, man. So again... You're known as the Greek god Papa Don, but that is for real. You are of Greek descent, so let's talk about your Greek background a little bit. Go ahead. What do you need to know? Family. You're sorry. So you were. So were you? You were obviously. So you, were your parents born here, or were the generation before them born here, or did they did they come here from from Greece? Or yes, they both came here from Greece. They were immigrants. I'm first generation Greek American. Um, they uh, came to New York. And um, they weren't married at the time. Obviously, they came on their own and they met here in New York. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My my dad was a, a chef or a cook. My mom was a waitress and they hooked up and they got married and they banged down some kids. And here I am. And unfortunately, my dad passed away uh, 12 years ago. So yeah, my so mom's only. That, Thank you. My mom's around. So I'm first generation. I got a, I got three brothers. And um, I'm the only pro wrestler out of out of the bunch. We're all crazy, uh, 
But I'm the only pro wrestler. So. <laughs> the only pro wrestler. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, you said that you, were, um, you lived in New York. So talk about li- life growing up in Brooklyn. Well, I never grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm a Queens kid. Okay. Um, the only reason why at first uh, people think I'm from Brooklyn is because Papa Don came from Brooklyn, meaning that uh, I was my wrestling started at the doghouse, the Long Island Wrestling Federation, the LIWF doghouse. I was trained by homicide, and that was in Brooklyn. So originally I was built from Brooklyn, but I'm not from Brooklyn in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, I'm a Queens boy at heart. Uh, grew up in Queens, went to school in Queens, went to Queens College. Um, now, I, now I live, you know, I don't live in Queens anymore. I live in LI, but, um, you know, it's it just typical New York background, you know, just went to school, played ball in the streets, uh, partied a lot, uh, <laughs> you know, graduated my college, graduated Queens College, got my degree in accounting, and uh, then went to wrestling school, met Homicide. And here I am, 23 and a half years later. So insane. That's, just, that's amazing. So you said you played football, baseball, and basketball. So was that competitively or you just did it like recreationally? Recreationally, but I did play a little JV baseball in high school. I went to Francis Lewis High School. Wasn't really great at it. So but other than that, you know, in the streets every day playing, having fun. No, no iPhones or iPads or nonsense like that when we were growing up. Exactly. And we're from the same we're from the same generation, man. So like we, we were literally outside till sometimes when the past the light, when the, when the street lights came on, you know what I mean? So definitely. that was a, that was the sick. That was the bad signal to come in the house. That's definitely for sure. Now, when was the first time that you actually saw pro wrestling for the very first time? When was that one time when you said, oh, wow, I got to sit down and watch this? I don't remember. I don't recall. Um, I definitely remember being a Hulkamaniac. Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely remember watching WWF, mm-hmm. Saturday night's main event, uh, WWE or WWF Saturday morning jobber show, whatever it was called. Superstars watching, and uh, wrestling challenge, yeah, yeah, and watching um, Heenan and Monsoon and Ventura and Monsoon and and just loving it. But my heart. Um, and my passion lies with the NWA and Jim Crockett promotions. Yes, sir. When I tell you, when I tell you that is my bread and butter. Um, every time I watch a clip online or I go back and watch wrestling, that's mm-hmm. the era that I'm drawn to. Um, the reason I became a professional wrestler, I wanted to be a pro wrestler, was because there was a match on television on channel 11 back mm-hmm. in the day it was w- wpix right it wasn't yes. uh, right it wasn't what it is today mm-hmm. and um it was sting versus flair nwa power pro power just a pro, regular yep. tv just a regular tv match and i saw it i fell in love with sting with his his uh blonde crew cut with the rat tail in the back the face pain his presence his aura the fact that he was a high flyer quote unquote mm-hmm. and you, you know what i mean and just the whole persona i felt for i liked him more than the ultimate warrior liked him more than than hogan oh, just i was a little stinger guy so i saw him I'm like this is what i wanted to do so i go in the kitchen at the time i remember we were living in jackson heights mm-hmm. and uh go to my mom my mom's washing dishes and i remember this like it's yesterday mm-hmm. I say ma i know what i want to be when i grow up she's like what do you want to be She's expecting doctor, lawyer, astronaut, something, right? Like, I want to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> She's like, all right, go play with your toys. So I felt like Ralphie from like what, Christmas Story. You know, mm-hmm. you'll shoot your eye out, kid, when everyone right. kept talking down to them. So exactly. that's what I felt like. And then I saw another match maybe a, a couple of months later. It was Sting versus Mike Rotunda for the NWA TV title. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, was in, he was in the varsity club at the time with Steiner and uh, Dr. Death and Kevin Sullivan and – there was a $15,000 cash uh, prize in a bag. And if you could beat Rotundo, I think in 10 minutes or under, you get the 15 grand and the title. Sting won. And I marked out huge. And I'm like, this is it. I said, Ma, he just made 15 grand in 10 minutes. I'm going to be a pro wrestler. I'm going to be rich. And uh, I graduated college and uh, found the Long Island Wrestling Federation uh, through a magazine, actually, through PW Insider, uh, P- P- uh, Pro Wrestling Industry, sorry. Pro Wrestling Illustrated because 
they had something called the Guide to the Independence. I'm like, what the hell is Independence? Mm -hmm. So I look in the book and I see all these wrestling companies. I'm like, what? So all I knew was AWA, NWA, WWF. I didn't know any of the indies. And I was looking to go to, uh, at the time, to go to um, Keller Kowalski's in Boston. Mm -hmm. And it was 99. Uh, I just graduated college, right? And through, you know, right before I was going to graduate college, I said, all right, once I'm done, I'm going to go to school. So I'm looking online and the internet not being what it is today. I couldn't find a location. I couldn't find an address. I couldn't find anything. So I'm like, damn it. So I find this magazine, and in the magazine, I see that in a uh, in uh, in Brooklyn, or uh, it was more Queens, 101. I think it was 101 Avenue. There's a Long Island Wrestling Federation. So I walked in, went with a buddy of mine. Um, he didn't join. Uh, I bump into Lathan Tower of Torture. He's like, "Come back tonight. You'll meet Bobby Lombardi. Talk to him." So I come in. I meet Bobby. Bobby's like, hey, what do you want to be a wrestler, kid? And I'm like, because uh, uh, I'm a fan. And Right, right. You know, rest in peace, Bobby. And then Bobby just went off. You see this guy over here? Kid Kung Bundy. You see this guy? You know, Tito Santana, see Georgia. This guy, this guy. They're all assholes. They're all pieces of crap. They're, they're just a bunch of carny guys. You still want to be a wrestler? Yes. All right. You see that guy right there? And it's homicide. All right? So... His homicide. He's gonna be a trainer, okay? I'm like, who the fuck is homicide? You know, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I, he didn't blow up yet either, you know. So it's like right. uh, all I knew from independent wrestling is what I knew from the magazines, which was A Starling, Reckless Youth, uh, uh, Dirty Don, uh, the Don Montoya, uh, you know, um, Devin Storm, you know, the the, the guys that were glorified, in, you know, on the local guys, industry. right? Yeah. So I knew their faces. I knew their names, right? I'm like, fuck's a homicide. All right. So whatever. So we started training. Uh, and then the school moved. Uh, like a month later, maybe. No, no. Like a couple weeks later, a week later, my car breaks down. I couldn't go for a week. Um, the school moved from 101 in Queens to 920 Jamaica Avenue in East New York, Brooklyn. All right. So after a month training, I had my pro debut, which is very uncanny. Uh, people usually train longer than that. Really? Um, so so how many? So how long? Oh, that was, was going to be my next question. So you're training with um 187 the, the, the notorious 187 homicide and you know mikey whipwreck so how long was the training between the from your first day until until your first booking a month really so you caught up to the business that quick yeah I, but i had such a drive and passion at the time i was working down on wall street mm -hmm. and uh i'd show up at the doghouse 10 11 o'clock at night i wouldn't get out of the ring till like 2 a.m 3 a.m they yell at me, Papa Don, get out of the ring. Well, it wasn't Papa Don at the time. Jimmy, get out of the ring. Right. They're like, oh, we want to play video games and smoke weed. Get out. All right. So I get out and go home, take a shower, get a couple hours sleep, wake up in the morning, hop on the train, go back to work. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And I, I, I was such a fan. I still am such a fan, but more so back then that I really wanted it really bad. And I still really want it bad now. But um, back then, I'd watch everything, all the shows, all the pay-per-views, everything. Right. Now, not so, not now, not so much. Not because I don't want to, I just don't have the time to. And, uh, um, you know, looking back, I, my first match was a great, not by the slightest. It was probably the drizzling shits, uh, to be honest with you. But it was, it was, in a, it was definitely an experience, you know. Um, and uh, ever since then, I've been growing and learning and. Honing my craft and trying to be uh, the best that I can be. So wow, that's, that I mean that's an incredible story, man. I just wanted to backtrack just a little bit. So, what was the process of getting your first booking? Because obviously, you know, obviously, you, you know, your trainers are going to tell you, "Hey, watch out for this, watch out for that." So, what was the process of you being brand new? You've uh, you've only been you know training a month, and you're getting on a card. Well, the good thing was. The LIWF at the time, the doghouse, we would have shows on every Saturday, weekly. Oh, wow. and yeah. And sometimes we'd have shows on Fridays after a while. We called the KFA Fridays uh, um, as a running joke. But the repetition of us wrestling in front of a live crowd every week was experience that you can't get anymore, obviously, unless mm. you're booked every weekend, you know, in front of 
different companies. But we built a following in, the, in, in Brooklyn. The same people would come and they'd follow the storylines and they'd follow the wrestlers and they they get into it. They believed in us and we were thankful for them attending. Um, so my first booking was at the LIWF, which was I was a student of. So, you know, it was great. Um, my first outside booking came because one of the one of the kids on the shows was doing a show and the promoter called me up and offered me a booking. I think I get paid like 30 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that for the first booking. Mm -hmm. And I got, I caught heat for it because they thought I was reaching out for bookings. I'm like, no, they called me. They're like, well, next time you, you gotta, you gotta run, you gotta make sure that you represent in school that you're going out there. You're ready. I'm like, I'm sorry. I was like, someone offered me an opportunity. I'm not going to say no, I didn't go out looking for it. Then everything was cool. And then maybe a year Year and a half later, after wrestling every weekend at the doghouse, um, the hit squad, uh, Danny Moff and Steve Mack, mm -hmm. um, got us into Jersey Championship Wrestling. Because at the time, they put me in a tag team uh, with Havoc, uh, Ed Toscano, my former partner, may he rest in peace. And they needed, to, they, they, we were the two white guys in black singlets. They go, oh, you guys could be a tag team. So they put us together and we were managed by the sure thing, uh, John Shane, who, in my opinion, is by far the greatest manager of all time that was never on TV. Him and another individual by the name of Rob Dimension, who used to uh, be very closely aligned with Steve Carino and PWF back in the day. Uh, and oh, actually, wow. him, and, him and Steve, I think, may have had a podcast or whatever at the time back in the day, or they used to go, I know they definitely used to dig at each other online and it was funny as hell. They were like the odd couple, but oh, wow. both, both, both those individuals, you know, I'm still in touch with both of them. They both deserve to have been on TV. Unfortunately, wrong place, wrong time. You know, if they were 10, 15 years earlier or five years earlier when they're still using managers, you guys would have made a killing because they both had great minds for the business. So they put us with John and we had a little cohesive unit. Um, and we didn't want a tag name. We wanted to pop it down and have it so our names can get out there like Edge and Christian, right? Right. But by Rick, Ricky O, the promoter uh, of JCW, he's like, no, we need a tag name. I'm world school. I want a tag team name. He goes, uh, let's call yourselves the wise guys. I'm like, mm, oh, that's very generic. You know, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. if we can come up, I was like, thank you. Uh, what if we come up with a name? Is that cool? Yeah, go ahead. So we're riding in the car one day, and I'm like, guys, I got a great name for it. something that's really catchy. Like, what? I'm like, let's call ourselves the final solution. And they look at me, they go, Are you joking me? Are you ribbing right now? I'm like, why? They're like, you moron, that's the Holocaust. We can't call yourself the final solution. I went, Oh, I didn't even put two and two together. I went, shit, you're right. I was like, then screw it. Why don't we just call ourselves the solution? Because everybody else is the problem. Done. Let's do it. Boom. Came up with the finishing maneuver which was a power bomb blockbuster off the top combination move that others use nowadays. Uh, we were the first team to ever use it. And um, we called it the problem solver. We had a good run. Um, we were, we teamed for about five, maybe six years, maybe five years, something like that. Wrestled all over, uh, went down to TNA, wrestled twice in TNA, um, wrestled uh, the Harris brothers in TNA, and wrestled uh, CM Punk and Julio De Niro. Unfortunately, we never got signed. Um, had great feuds with America's Most Wanted in New Jersey for NWA Cyberspace or Cyberspace Championship Wrestling at the time, or Cyberspace Wrestling Federation at the time. Then it turned into NWA Cyberspace. Um, and then we went our separate ways because we wanted more tag matches with bigger tag team names. We were wrestling the same teams over and over again. Around the circuit, and, right, right, right. And we're like, yo, we want to be in Ring of Honor wrestling the Bristol Brothers and the Backstreet Boys. Uh, why Why are Christmas Street Connections, why is the Hit Squad's getting an opportunity? We're not getting an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So Havoc and I just said, all right, you know, we don't want to be the two old grizzled guys in the back saying, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda, my, back in my day, let's try singles. So I went into singles. I was just Papa Don at the time. And Mikey Whipper goes to me, hey, can't just be Papa Don. You got to be something else. Come up with a gimmick. Gimmick. Fuck. Okay. Um, I said, I'm Greek. Greeks invented wrestling. Maybe I can do something with that. I said, okay, let me come up with something Greek. Greek what? Greek, the Greek gladiator? Nah, it's too wordy. So I'm trying to think like, like GG. I'm like, Greek gargoyle? No, nah, that sounds ridiculous. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Greek god. The Greek god Papadon. Kind of prolos. And I went with that. So that's how uh, that's how it came all about. 
Wow, yeah, because I mean that's what I was gonna ask as far as once you once you found that character as far as you know, I don't want to say gimmick, but something you wanted to gravitate, but it's 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 almost paying homage to your to your heritage, you know what I mean? Your, your of your Greek heritage, you know what I mean? So what was the transition like for you going from tag team? Because I know you, you know, you and Havoc with Team of Guys Solution. What was the transition for you going in from tag to single? Um, you know what? Dusty Rhodes once said this in order to become a great singles wrestler, you should need to become a great tag wrestler first. I said, wait a minute, why? And now I know why. When you're a tag team wrestler, mm-hmm. you learn how to cut off the ring. You know yeah. how to you learn you know, you you learn how you learn psychology without trying to learn psychology. And the transition wasn't very difficult, only because I'm the type of person, I have a very uh, very strong alpha personality where if I want something, I go for it, no matter what. I don't take no for an answer. I mean, mm-hmm. case in point, I'm still on the indies doing my thing 23 years later, right? So I said, if I'm going to be the single guy and start doing single, I've always, I'm always the guy who wants all eyes on him, right? I walk into the room. I want people looking at me. I want people, not because, you know... Um, you could say uh, I'm insecure or anything like that. It's because I'm a ham. I like I like the attention. You know, if I'm doing something, I want people to notice what I'm doing because I'm good at what I'm doing. Um, so I want right. some recognition. The only problem with tag team is you're in the three other guys, your partner and your two opponents. Right. You could be great, and the other three guys can be horrible, and mm-hmm. it brings down the match. And it's all variables that are out of your control. That bothered me a lot because we'd get in the ring at times with other teams and they mm-hmm. couldn't even hold lace our boots and it brought down the match and it just killed us. It's like, oh, man. So being a singles guy to me was better because I was able to put the matches together. I was able to take it on the roller coaster ride and, and come up with finishes and get the the – crowd in the palm of my hands and because of the way my journey has been structured i find it that it's been very beneficial to me because i'm not a wrestler you know i did a podcast last night and i told this on the other Mm -hmm. podcast i am not a wrestler i am a worker there's a big difference between being a wrestler and being a worker a wrestler goes through the moves you could teach a you could teach a monkey to be a wrestler you could teach a dog to do tricks I make an emotional connection with the fans and I make moments that sticks in the fans minds and they go home remembering who I am. First and foremost, I get my opponent over because that's my job and I get the, the story angle or the angle of the match over the story that we're trying to tell. And my opponent are two objectives for me to get over. So the fans can get emotionally attached to us and get emotionally right. attached to what we're trying to tell them. So that's first and foremost, what I need to do. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, in between time, I can get myself over as well. And getting being being able to make that emotional connection and being able to work a crowd and being able to give the crowd what they want because you're reacting to what they're giving you. Because right. wrestling's not acting, it's reacting, right? Mm-hmm. Is a lost art form. A lot of kids these days, and a lot of men or people or women or whatever, they just go out there, they plan from A to Z. And they go out there and they slap their legs and they look like a bunch of trained seals doing spots and doing moves and doing stuff. And it doesn't resonate and doesn't connect with the people. I go out there. I go out there. I do my thing, whatever the thing is. And that's why I like being healed because I'm a ring general. I like controlling the situation in my environment. And I know when I'm putting the match together and I'm having the getting that heat, Mm -hmm. it's on me. And if the match is good, it's because my the, the, my opponent and I worked together to make it good, but because I structured the match a certain way, I was able to get in everyone's mental and take them on that emotional roller coaster ride and get them to that that plane that they need to be where we need them to be at the end of the match on a high note. And you know, sometimes you know incidents happen, you know, accidents happen or whatever sure. the case may have, and it doesn't always happen. But I can I can assure you, nine out of nine nine point nine out of ten times, I'm getting to you where you need to be and getting everybody over and the story across. And I may sound a little arrogant saying that, but it's not arrogance. It's confidence in my, cause I know what I can do. 
You know, 23 years of doing this, to, it's like changing socks to me. It's like a sixth sense. You put me in the ring right now with Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania, I guarantee you it's going to be what these kids call a five-star match nowadays. You know, yes. but... Right. That's the way I am. I'm sorry. I, I, I ramble. No, I no, 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 no. It's cool, man. Like I said, because for any young worker that's listening right now, you know, that can that can get some some 411 for, for a veteran of 23 and a half years that's been doing this a long time. And I was going to ask you, do you prefer working heel versus baby? I like both. But only reason why I like being a heel, because I know what I can bring to the table and generate from the crowd, because there's two things. The money's in the cell. And the money's in the heat. Right. That's it. It's not in slapping your thigh. It's not doing the craziest move. It's because people after seeing something, they'll pop huge first time. By the Mm -hmm. 10th time they've seen it, it's watered down. The reaction from the crowd isn't as loud. And what happens? You're a one-trick pony. Now the trick isn't as extravagant as it used to be. So you're not over. Your trick's not over. You your opponent never got over because you were a one trick pony and the story never got over. So at the end of the day, no one's over. Right. So it's like, you're, it's like you're pissing in the wind. It doesn't make any sense. In, in my opinion, moves don't mean anything. Making that emotional attachment with the crowd. So they believe in who you are and who your opponent is, is the, is the secret sauce in what we do. Um, there's an old wrestler, Johnny Valentine. You, you know him. Oh I don't yeah. Know if anyone, anyone oh, you're listening. Too- you may not know him. That's Greg the Hammer Valentine's dad. Dad, yeah. Right? He had a saying, and I use this as my mantra to, to what I do. It's, you may not believe wrestling is real, but I'll make you believe I'm real. I'm real. That's one of my favorite quotes in the business that I heard. Actually, I heard Jim Cornette quote that on a podcast one time, and it is very, very true. Because if you look at, I mean, heck, you look at Greg Valentine, and granted, he may have worked a slow, methodical style, but you believed in every move he made, and he made those moves count. You didn't care about his wrestling. You cared about the fact that he was a heel, and you he was trying to get the bay face. So one of my favorite feuds of all time, Papa Don, is Tito Santana and Greg Valentine back in 84. Great, great feud. Over great the IC feud. title. Yeah. And he, and he, broke, he broke Santana's leg, and I was invested. Granted, Hogan was selling out the crowds and all that stuff, but it was those matches that I care about. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, again, I guarantee if you would go back and watch those matches, they didn't do uh, 50 Canadian destroyers. They didn't slap no. their leg once. No. They didn't, they didn't uh, go out on social media afterwards and thank their opponent and thank the referee. It's an honor being in the ring with you. Or more importantly, they didn't go on social media. You didn't see Greg the Hammer Valentine going on social media doing silly things when people thought he was a hard ass and, and a heel. And then you go on his, on, on his social media and he's sitting there in a thong with a whipped cream, you know, foam party, you know, in the middle of nowhere. I don't know. I'm just trying to make things up. Point is, there was some mystic, there was some there was some mystique to these individuals back in the day that made you believe. Oh, once 100 percent I mean, Piper being one of them. Orndorff being another. I mean, you literally thought those guys were, were legit badasses. You know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I tell kids this all the time. I hate sounding kids like I'm an old man or something. But there's a movie that came out. has nothing to do with wrestling. Mm-hmm. It's called The Prestige by Christopher Nolan. Right? Mm-hmm. It, it's about magicians. And it's Christian Bale, Hugh Jackman are opposing magicians. Right? Mm-hmm. Start as their friends then become adversaries. The whole movie is about pro wrestling without it being about pro wrestling. Because at the end, I don't want to spoil anything. It's a fantastic movie, The Prestige. I strongly suggest people to watch it. And if you're a wrestling fan, you'll see exactly why it is about wrestling. But at the end result, when they do the payoff at the end of the movie, you see that why it's about wrestling. And that's what's lost today. You don't. You, it's hard to believe in somebody. It's hard. Listen, I may catch heat from saying this, because he's very talented, and I know the kid a long time. We've worked together, and but MJF, mm-hmm. right? He's the king of the castle over there in AEW. I would love to have his spot right right now. I would love to be the champ at AEW, making fucking tons of cash. Right. So kudos to him. He's earned everything that he's gotten. But he's not doing anything that's extraordinary to the point where it's different and it's new age. He's doing the fundamentals and the building blocks of professional wrestling. Mm-hmm. 
and he's holding true to his craft. Mm-hmm. Not to knock what he's doing, because what he's doing is brilliant. But you see, he goes out there, and you believe that he's a prick. Mm-hmm. Because 24-7, he, he is. He's being a prick. And sooner or later, the lie becomes the truth. Now, I know the real Max. Is he a prick? I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say yes. And you don't but, have to. Exactly. That's exactly where I was going with that, bro. I don't you want don't have, have to. to. No. But, but you believe in him. So he's over. You know what I mean? As opposed exactly. to another wrestler who gets there and does 27 flippity floppity, you know, and slaps his leg like an idiot and the sits in a leg slap city. And, you know, six months later, he's out the door and some new flippity floppity guy comes with different hairstyle, you know, just like. And then the other guy can't recoup what he once had or what she once had because it's already been done. So this episode of the d podcast is brought to you by Goalie Nutrition. As someone who's used Goalie for quite some time, I can tell you that they're not only very good, but they're very beneficial. My favorite are the Super Green Gummies. The Super Green Gummies are uniquely crafted with a spectrum of essential nutrients such as vitamins A, B12, folic acid, and theamine. It supports a healthy liver function, healthy nervous and immune system, digestive health, a boost to your metabolism, and overall health and well-being. There are no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or colors from artificial sources. They're vegan-friendly, gluten-free, and gelatin-free. All loyal listeners of the DLU podcast get a special 10% discount at checkout. Go to Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. That's Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. Yeah, you're right. You know, like I said, there's a lot of truth what you're saying. And I mean, and again, it's, it's all going back to the fundamentals. It's all it's going back to the psychology, you know, as far as getting the people that pay their hard earned money to come see you wrestle or perform, investing in you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're investing in you, and you have to give them that and, and give them a reason to care. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Give them a reason to care. Like I, like I mentioned the Santana Valentine feud earlier, but it's true. They gave me the reason to care at six years old. But I do want to talk about one night in particular back in April 2012, and that's where I saw you for the very first time. You have the prestige of being one of 26 men to win the ECWA Super 8 tournament. While you were the ECWA heavyweight champion at the time, in the succession, you you defeated the premier athlete Tony Nese, Bobby Fish, and then the finals you defeated Bandito Jr. What did that mean to you having that bes- that honor bestowed upon you, not only being the champion, but being in, in this prestigious tournament. Because the Super 8 tournament is one of the premier events, you know, all, all, in all of the indie circuit. And we all know that. There's been a tremendous amount of people that's, that's done the tournament. You know, Brian Dangus has done it. Uh, Reckless Youth, Devin Storm, the list goes on and on. So what was that feeling for you that night? It was surreal. It was a dream come true. Um, the little backstory behind ECWA. Um, I was trying to get into ECWA for the longest when Kettner had it. Mm-hmm. Um, Havoc and I, and then just me, myself, we'd go down and watch a show. Cause everyone's like, yo, Kettner's old school. You got to go down there. You got to set up table. You got to set up chairs, break set down chairs, mm-hmm. you know, help out. And he'll give you an opportunity. Well, we did that. No opportunity came our way. Um, there one time, uh, Havoc's like, I'm done going. He's never going to book us. So I kept going. And then one day in the Battle Royal, someone didn't show up. And I said, he's like, I'm going to put you in. You brought your gear, right? Always. (laughs) Always, bro. Come on. That's right. So did my deal, whatever. Then um, wasn't used again. I went and I told him, I said, hey, man, I'm available if you need me. All right. Um, For whatever reason, I don't know. You know? I asked him, I said, do you not like me? Is it something I did? He goes, no, it's nothing. It's just doing nothing for you, which sucks, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then he sells the company. Then I get booked by Joey Zanoli, uh, who was the booker at the time, and uh, Mike Tartaglia. And they liked what they saw, and they gave me an opportunity and gave me this mega push as a champ. And then they put me in the Super 8. No champ has ever won the Super 8. Right. You know? So it's just, it was history in the making. I was able to get a nice two-page spread in, in Pro Wrestling Illustrated, a magazine I grew up, you know, reading as a child, mm-hmm. which is something a lot, a lot of people can say. 
Um, so it was definitely a fun time. I had a great run. Wrestled a lot of great wrestlers. Wrestled Tommaso Ciampa. Wrestled Adam Cole. Um, you know, uh, Tony Nese, Bobby Fish. So you named a couple. Uh, you know, tons of people. But the funny thing is this: the one I wanted that night. The finals, unfortunately, Bandito Gino got hurt, so we had to end it quick. And we right. did. And I felt bad because he was upset because he got hurt. But then, after everything was said and done, he was fine. It was just a little. He knocked the wind out of himself. He hurt his rib or something happened on a springboard. We landed awkwardly, and we took it home right away. So it was it was it was nice. But at the same time, I wish the main event could have been a little bit more. But it's one of those things that you can't control. It's just a freak accident. It's not mm -hmm. ballet, right? Exactly. So so it was a dream come true to me. So um, as far as everything else, I mean, I had a great run there. Very great run there. Two times champion. Uh, wrestler of the year a few times with them. Great following. Held my career, career uh, tremendously. Um, you know, now I think someone else owns it. Some guy, Ryan, who... Uh, Good promoter from Wayne Stan. He used to run World One. Mm -hmm. um, so they're doing I know, well. And I know Ryan. I know Ryan. I'm actually going to be working to Super 8 on, you know, very, very soon. So. Oh, that's right. Congratulations, man. Thank you, man. So this this is an honor for me. So we'll share that lineage forever, man, that I'll get that's to be a cool. part of the as a ring announcer for the uh, Super 8 tournament. Now, what's the best advice that a mentor gave you about the industry? And that could be in any part of your career. There's a few things. Less is more. Shut up. Keep your ears open. Mm -hmm. um, be be respectful. And be I mean, these are just common sense things, you know. Be respectful. Be be polite. Show respect. Um, someone gives someone brings it to you. Bring it back. Don't 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 take it. Meaning that if someone stiffs you in the ring, stiff them back. Don't be, don't be, don't be, uh, don't be a wussy. It's a man's sport. Um, you'll learn their respect if you put, if you, if you give it back to them. Um, Mikey Whitbrick, I asked him one time, hey, Mikey, because he, I was trained by homicide. But then mm -hmm. when they, when, when the doghouse closed, I continued my training at the NYWC Academy and Mikey Whitbrick took me under his wing and polished me up. So I continued my training under him. So I continued, I asked him one day, is it okay if I can, say that you're one of my trainers i consider you one of my trainers he's like sure thing so with his blessings you know i say i've been trained by mikey and homicide which to me is a great experience because they're those are the two guys where everyone who's anyone out of northeast wrestling comes from so from the sat and red mega uh low key the hit squad uh, myself deranged asriel i mean the, the, the low life louis i mean Anyone who's anyone came from those two individuals. So I was very fortunate to sit under both learning trees, and I learned a lot from both individuals. And uh, my, I go to ask, ask Mikey one day, what do I need to do to get to the next level? He looked at me and goes, lose your belly. Okay. And I lost a ton of weight. And I got into great shape, and I've been able to maintain that shape. Do I need to lose a little bit? Yeah, maybe I need to lose a little 10 pounds, the 10 pounds of COVID that I gained, whatever. But we all do. But anyway. Point being is that, uh, yeah, man, people talk, I listen. I absorb everything like a sponge. So that's – and then that's what I tell people. You always, always learn. And, you know, people ask me who's my favorite opponent. I tell them my next one because I know I'm going to learn something new and I know I'm going to do something right. Um, and it's just another chapter in my story. Uh, so uh, it, the day you stop learning, you know, 23 years in the business, I still train at NYWC. Uh, not as frequently as I'd like to because life gets in the way, you know? For sure. I got four kids. That's what happens. Um, but if I can't learn anything when I step through those ropes, something's wrong. If I don't get nervous before I'm going out, something's wrong. Right. So, right. you know what I mean? So, so I'm still learning. I still get nervous. So that's a good, that's a good sign. And that means you care. And it was crazy. You, It was the perfect segue because you alluded to it a little bit. But I was asking you, I was going to ask you, you know, conditioning is is the key part, you know, in, in performing at the highest level. And what's the day in the life of the Greek God to stay in the peak condition that you're in after 23 and a half years in this business? 
Oh, man, I'm burning the candle on both ends, to be honest with you. Uh, let's see. I wake up in the morning. I go to the gym. I go do half hour to an hour of cardio every uh, almost every morning, mm-hmm. um, which is not much. I just walk on an incline. That's it. I don't like to run. The only other cardio I would do is probably jump rope, and I haven't done that in a few months. Um, come home. Take a shower, take the kids to school, go to work, my shoot job, work my my work my day. Afterwards, go to the gym, lift, come home, help my wife put the kids to bed, and then watch a little TV, unwind, do a podcast or two, go to bed, repeat. <laughs> or and then search in certain days I'll go to Ed the Deer Park Long Island and go train at NYWC till like eleven, twelve o'clock at night. Awesome, awesome. Now, as you as you said, there's been there's the things the AML you you wrestle for, like I said, ECWA and there's several other promotions you wrestle for across the you know around the country. <laughs> In your opinion, and I know you said some things about, you know, keeping your mouth shut and things of that nature as far as listening, but what's the most important part of being able to keep getting booked on a constant basis if you're in the Indies? Um, Being different and making sure that you're giving them quality. The problem is nowadays people, I don't want to sound disgruntled, but we're a horse. Wrestlers are whores at the end of the day. They'll sell their mother for an opportunity. Um, but a lot of these guys, they'll wrestle for free. A lot of these guys will wrestle for 20 bucks. Not me. Never have, never will. A lot of these guys will pay for their airline ticket to go wrestle overseas. Not me. Never will. I'm a professional wrestler. I take that to heart. And if I have to go wrestle for a little less than my asking price if i think it's worth it that's my decision but i tell people you want a 20 dollar wrestler you're gonna get a 20 dollar match you want a pop it on you're gonna get a pop it on match and it's gonna bring, bring people back and people are gonna remember who i am and it's gonna be the loudest ovation of the night i guarantee you and every time people are like yeah right okay what do you have to lose one opportunity I guarantee you I earned the other 99% of your confidence. You give me that 1% right now. Okay. And then at the end of the day, damn, man, you were right. I once had a promoter tell me, and I'm going to leave him out of no names, but I'm going to tell him, he goes to me, hey, Pop, let me ask you something. I went around asking people who they come to see, and no one told me your name. Everyone told me all the top baby faces, but no one told me your name. I said, of course not. He looked at me in surprise. What do you mean, of course not? I'm a heel, man. They're not paying to come see me. They're paying to come see their favorite wrestler kick my ass. That's my job, to get your baby faces over. Mm -hmm. Flair did it for his entire career. I go, Mm -hmm. no one's going to come and cheer the bad guy unless they like cheering bad guys, but they won't admit it because then then people think they're nuts. So at the end of the day, the only reason why they're coming to see the good guy is because they hate me and they want that guy to kick my ass. And the promoter looks at me and goes, huh, I never thought about it like that. I said, of course not. You're not from the wrestling industry. You're from another industry, and now you're trying to get into the wrestling industry. And I just schooled you with some knowledge, so you're welcome. And he's like, you know what, Papa Don? I hate you. I said, well, I love you too, bro. Don't worry about it. You know? I was like, I'm here for you. <laughs> I said, I should charge you extra for that lesson. But anyway. <laughs> so what was it like getting the opportunity to wrestle – for AEW, I know you did AEW Dark a couple of times. So, what was that experience like for you? And also, too, has there been any feelers from, you know, for a potential of signing a contract with, you know, AEW or even WWE? Well, uh, let's see. The first time I was with AEW was down in Florida during the pandemic at the um, the Jaguar Stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, it was amazing. Because I've done a couple of shots, not a couple. I've done a few shots with WWE during mm-hmm. the Laurinaitis era. And every time I went, I got touted for my ability. You're really good, but you're not tall enough. We want guys who are 6'4", 6'2". Vince is looking for this. 
don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Maybe one day it'll change. This week it's chocolate. Maybe next week it's vanilla. Maybe six months from now we want strawberry. Exactly. No problem. So the walking on eggshells rumors and all that stuff, Not tr- it was kind of true. You're always like intimidated by the surroundings because you're in the largest wrestling company in the world. For sure. But, when, but the first time I went to AEW, it was so chill, so laid back. It was like a giant party uh, because everybody was just so happy to be there. Everybody was relaxed. There was no walking on eggshells. It was a different environment. Um, then a year later, I I mean, I had a match. It was myself and um, – oh, I'm so bad with names. He's from Florida. He was in the Cruiserweight Classic. Um, Samoan. Um, oh man, I feel bad forgetting his name. Great wrestler. We wrestled the Dark Order. Okay. Uh, it was uh, you know, Player One and Stu Grayson. That rendition of the Dark Order. Gotcha. And we had a, we had a ten minute tag match, whatever it was, and it was good because they gave me a lot more than I expected. They were very gracious. And we had a good match, and they loved it. They're like, dude, you sold perfectly. You are exactly where we needed you to be for everything. Not a lot of people do that. We have to drag them to certain spots. We didn't have to waste any emotion with you. It was good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then I hear nothing. Okay. year later, I reach out. say, hey, man, uh, I haven't heard anything. I want to get an opportunity. So I go down to D.C. I had to get a D.C. wrestling, wrestling license. The whole nine yards, physical, you know, everything that you need to get. For sure. I go there, look at my name on the card, Mercer Lance Archer. I said, oh, I'm going to get squashed in two minutes. Great. All right. Well, it's going to be the best two minutes of his career. Let's go. Lance walks up. I walk up to Lance. I say, hey, man, we're dancing tonight. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I started laughing. He goes, uh, I'm not going to squash. I don't like squashing people. He goes, let's come up with something, and we'll throw it together. All right, thanks, man. So we throw a match together real quick. Again, we had five minutes, whatever it was. Right. And it was what and it was what it was. What you saw what it was. He gave me a lot of offense, which was very gracious of him. Just shows what kind of gentleman he truly is. Nice guy. He's really then nice the, guy. Then the next night, I wasn't on the card, but someone didn't show. And they put me in the Brian Cage goes to me, Hey man, you want to work? Yeah. I like to get paid while I'm here. Sure, let's work. So Brian again, very gracious, very professional, gave me a lot of offense. And him and I worked. And it was very, very good. Got nothing but great reviews from the agents, from everyone I wrestled with. Um, no quarries, no bad negative feedback, nothing. Nothing's happened since then. So, you know? Okay. And well, the thing is this. People go to me. And this is the story of my career, bro. 23 years I've been everywhere. I wrestled overseas. I wrestled for WWE. Wrestled for TNA, wrestled for Ring of Honor, wrestled for the NWA, wrestled for AW. And every time I've been on a, and, and any one of their stages, I've gotten praised for my ability to do what I do. But it's never gone further. It's like I hit that bump in the road, that glass ceiling, and it's never past that level. Why? I don't know. Have I pissed people off being too honest? Maybe. Do I not kiss enough ass? Definitely, because I don't kiss ass. Um, I don't know. That's the million-dollar question. But I don't give up. And people like, does it bother you? I don't want to say no. Because everyone, like, put it this way. 2012 Super 8, my first opponent. My buddy, Tony Nice, one of my favorite opponents. Right. Went to WWE, AEW. Second opponent, Bobby Fish. Went to WWE, went to AEW. I was not an AW. Uh, third opponent, Bandito Jr., referee in WWE. Hmm. Weird. It's like everyone I touch gets signed or get go somewhere, yet I'm stuck here. So it it is a little of, of a mind fuck, if you will. Mm-hmm. But it comes back around to what I was told first day of, of – of, getting into this business this business doesn't owe me a goddamn thing there's no guarantees so 23 years later you know 
am I, should I be on national TV? If you ask me, I'm going to say yes. If you ask other wrestlers, they'll tell you yes. You ask fans, they say yes. You ask promoters, they say yes. Why am I not there? I don't know. Am I salty? Am I pissed off about it? No. Because again, this business doesn't owe me anything. Am I thankful to be in this business? Yes. It's my dream to be a professional wrestler. Will I like it to be my main source of income and be my my career? Absolutely. Will it? Who knows? Time will tell. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. You know what I mean? That's exactly what it is. And I'm, I can I can attest to the same thing. I've been in the entertainment industry now 13 years, you know, as far as acting and music and things. And I get asked all the time, like, well, why aren't you here? Or why aren't you there? We already know what the destination is going to be, but it's all about the experiences, meeting people, networking with people, building relationships, because, heck, a relationship that you that you you could cement five years prior can be a relationship that can help you get you to the next level down the road. So yeah. you just have to just keep moving and keep going. And that's the one thing that, you know, I'm glad we're talking about because Everyone, everyone has their own different journeys and destinations and detours, but we all know where we're trying to get to. So I'm glad you told your story because if there's, I don't care what vocation you're in, even if you're in the wrestling industry, entertainment, sports, in the corporate world or whatever, and you're maybe you're not getting that promotion or whatever the case, just keep trying, keep going, keep doing things, keep adding layers to your game. So when it is, what's the old expression? Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Nice. Yes. And there's another saying that I have that I kind of use as a, as a secondary mantra to me. Uh, Macho Man once said this, if you walk away from the table, you're never going to get a winning hand. Mm-hmm. So my ass is sitting at the table to the day I die. So we'll see what happens. That's right, man. So let's talk about another aspect of your career. You appeared in The Wrestler. So talk about the experience of uh, being on set with Mickey Rourke and things of that nature. It was very interesting. Um, the producer uh, calls me up. He's a friend of mine. Um, and tells me, hey, Papa Don. His name's Evan Ginsberg, by the way. Mm-hmm. Hey, Papa Don. Uh, why don't you come read for a movie? I said, come on, man. I'm not an actor. He goes, you're a professional wrestler. I'm like, it's reacting, not acting. He goes, I know, but what do you have to lose? Fine. So I go down there. Read for the part. I get called in for a second reading. I was like, oh, really? Okay. Get called in for a second reading. Didn't get the part I was reading for. Mm-hmm. Um, that went to Tommy. For, I forgot his last name. Uh, he was trained by Alpha. It's the guy who had the mohawk in the movie. Okay. All right. The real mm-hmm. Jack Diesel guy. He was uh, uh, whatever. Um, good guy. Great worker. Mm-hmm. Um I get a call saying, hey, man, uh, why don't you come in? We need extras. We need people in the background. And I said, oh, okay. A uh, couple questions. Number one, am I getting paid? He goes, you're the only guy who asked me that. I was like, well, you know, not for nothing. It's a business. I need to make money. He laughed. He goes, yeah, you're getting paid. I said, number two, where is it? He goes, oh, we're shooting two days in New Jersey. Are you free? I said, yeah, I'll be there. Okay, I said, no, wait. I said before I hang up, I said, uh, how am I going to get paid? Do I get SAG waivers? How does this work? He goes, uh, yeah, if you want SAG waivers, you're going to have to wait two weeks for your check because that's how it works. I said, well, I'm going to England after the two days for a three-week three, day, three week tour to wrestle. Kind of need cash. You guys going to pay you cash? He goes, yeah, we can pay you cash, but you then we can't pay you SAG waivers. I said, all right, fine, let's do it. So I got to pay cash because I need some cash in my pocket because I went to England. Um but going there was very interesting because uh, it was a mixture of the crowd itself was all extras and actually wrestling fans. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was an event presented by Alpha, right? WXW. Yeah. And they filmed us walking into the locker room. They filmed a bunch of scenes in the locker room. And what made the movie made the movie. Uh, I was surprised to see how much I was in the movie. I was surprised they used some of the verbiage that i said in the movie um and it was a great experience uh, at one point um they were ahead of schedule they're like hey can you wrestle because they would 
put on a match, mm-hmm. then they would film certain aspect in the movie in the ring, put on another match, go back, film something else, put on a match, film the locker room scene while a match is going on, take an intermission, film something else, you know? So you know how it works. Yeah. And uh, I was like, ah. Oh. I was like, all right, I'll wrestle. I'll do you the favor. They're like, okay, it'll be you and Paul Enormous. And Paul Enormous was the guy standing next to me with the big snake tattoo on his chest. May right. rest in peace. Sweetheart of a guy. So we go out there. They're like, okay, Pops, you're going to be baby. Okay. So I wrestle him as baby face, whatever, whatever. We have a good match. We're about to come, we, I come in the back. He comes in the back. Thank you. Thank you. You know, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. We brother right up for a second. And then all of a sudden, there's some guy comes. Hey, man, Mickey Rourke wants to talk to both of you guys. Okay. So we go over the side. Mickey goes, Man, that was such a good match. He goes, you guys are really, really talented. I really enjoyed that. That was very entertaining. Good stuff on both you guys. You guys looked the part. Awesome. Just awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Don't quit. Don't give up. You guys have a future. Okay. Thank you, Mick. Thank you. Appreciate it. He walks off, goes into his dressing room. Look at Paulie. We're like, huh. It's like, look at this shit. Mickey Rourke just put us over. And that's going. <laughs> I go. I go, that's going in the fucking autobiography. That's going on the shoot tape. That's going to go on the interviews. So here there you it go. Is. <laughs> there it is. It was, a, it was a fun little experience. A little side note, when I went to go see the movie, when it debuted in the theaters, mm-hmm. I went with my wife. And I didn't tell anyone I was in the movie. I'm not one of those guys who, hey, man, I'm in a movie. I'm in a movie. I don't, you know, and then I go there and only my shoulders in a scene, you know, like a piece, right. piece of. So when I get there, my wife sees me. She's like, she sees more of me. She's more of me. Here's my voice. Then they hear me, my name. They mentioned my name in the movie, Papa Don, and this first guy versus wrestling, you know, whoever in the main event. She looks at me, and I'm like, okay. She's like, why don't you tell me you were in so much? I'm like, because I didn't know what they were using, and I don't want to brag about stuff that doesn't happen. So then when everyone else saw the movie, that could, same thing. We didn't know you were in the movie. Oh, my God, that was a great surprise, yada, yada, yada. So it was a fun little experience. But again, hopefully that wasn't my 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Because uh, I got a lot more in the tank to give. So we'll see what happens. Awesome. Awesome. Now, one more question I do have is, um, do you feel that both on the indie level and the mainstream level that pro wrestling is in a good place? That's a very good question. Um, Yes and no. There's more opportunities for a lot of individuals. Um. The actual wrestling itself depends. Uh, again, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, what flavor do you like? Um, there's a lot of guys in the business right now that aren't ra- workers. They're wrestlers. Mm-hmm. And they need to learn how to work. They need to stop slapping their legs and being citizens of Leg Slap City, which I hate. I nominate myself the governor of real town because every time you go in there, you think it's real. Um, And that bothers me. The lack of selling bothers me. The lack of heels trying to get heat bothers me because that's where the money's in. This, this, this battle is as, it's as old as time. It's good versus evil. And depending on the size of the competitors, it could be David and Goliath. You can't reinvent the wheel because it's not broken. Don't try it. What got you to the dance will keep you at the dance. So keep doing what you got to do. But when you try to alter it, and I understand people's attention spans because of phones and technology being where it's at has changed, has minimized. But the problem is when you're working for the applause from the fans, then the fans become the puppet master. And they're the ones who are dictating the match. You as the performer, you as the worker, should be the puppet master and give the fans what they want without them knowing they want it. You know what I'm saying? You go out there and you tell the fans, this is what you're going to do, without telling them, hey, this is what you're going to do. And you subliminally get them there. There's an old movie it's not old, but it's a, there's a there's a movie from a few years back called Taking Them to the Greek. 
Mm -hmm. right? And Puffy's in it, and they get, I think they smoke a bone or they smoke an L, and he's feeling up the curtains or something. Something, something to the point where he said Jeffrey was the tagline they were using for the scene. Mm -hmm. And it was just a mind fuck. That's wrestling. You mind fuck everybody without knowing they get mind fucked because I'll go out there. You want me to portray what? A, B, and C? No problem. I'll go out there. I'll give the fans A, B, and C, but they didn't know they want A, B, and C. But when the match is over, they're hollering and they're screaming A, B, and C because that's my job. That, I think, has been lost a lot. A lot. Because now people are too worried about flippity doodahs and how many stars their matches get and what chance they get as opposed to being disliked or getting under someone's skin and being hated. I'd rather be a heel and be a dirty heel and win every time by cheating and being dirty and being booed out the building than getting a five-star match because I did a flippity doo or some other weird move because I don't care. Moves don't mean anything to me. So I think from that, from that's just my point of view. So from my point of view, um, that scenario has come into play a lot because it's more of an athletic situation i mean the athlete the athleticism of some of the kids nowadays is phenomenal mm -hmm. but the believability isn't there and the believability needs to be the fundamentals that need to be there that needs to be the foundation that you're building on because when you build something on a weak foundation sooner or later it comes crumbling down like a house of cards and that's an issue because then people get turned off and they don't watch anymore you know um, you're watching two guys fight in a ring. It's predetermined. You know that. They know that. Mm -hmm. But for that 10 minutes, that 20 minutes, that five minutes that you're in the ring, if you could take away their disbelief and give them something to believe in, mm -hmm. then you're doing your, you're doing your job, and that's been lost. Granted, certain people they get to a certain level and they're so over, they can do whatever they want. That's the exception to the rule. People's elbow, the worm, uh, you know, whatever. But point is that until you get there, you got to do it the right way and do it to where you, that what you're doing elevates you to the next level. So you get to do, get to that level where you can do whatever you want and be, you know, as silly or as serious as you want to be. And they'll bite into it because they already bit, bit into you before. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. almost like you become a character of yourself, but that character is what's in everyone's hearts and everyone's mind and everyone's soul. So you can work with that and make whatever you want out of that clay that you've already established with them. And, and a lot of people don't get that. People are too worried about, oh, I need to do a cool move. I need to get a, a chant. I need to, I need to look strong. I don't need to look strong, man. I'm a heel. All I need to do is be cowardly. Baby faces move forward, heels move back. It's that simple. It's that simple. Yep, begging off. <laughs> that's, that's, it, that's, the, that's the that's 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 the simple stuff. But it's the, I, I would rather look at a match of just the basic things that creates wrestling and what it is than the boom, 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 boom. Because you can't process all of that. It's fun. Yeah. Every once in a while, it's cool to, to see some of the, you know, if you, I know one match a few years ago got, uh, got heat. I think it was, uh, Will Ospreay and Ricochet. I think Vader went to town on it. Vader hated the match, but a lot of people went at Vader because it's like this, this new age of fans is like, no, that match was great. I mean, it was athletic. It was fun to watch, but I think from the school that Vader comes from, you know, Obviously, he's come, you know, wrestling in Japan and all over the world. It's like it was a different deal, and it's much far more psychology based than it is now. Yes, but to to play devil's advocate, I like that opening sequence. It kind of reminds me of one of the greatest opening sequences in wrestling history, which was Amazing Red and Loki at Ring of Honor doing that hidden dragon, to, hidden tiger, whatever you know that punch punch duck thing that they right did, right right that, that everyone's. You know, try to emulate at that time, but it was at that time uh, different and world renowned and just game changing. Um, but again, wrestling, in my opinion, is like the circus, and not because of carny bullshit and all that nonsense. 
You go to the circus. The lion tamer is going to stick his head in the lion's mouth. The juggler is going to juggle. The tight rope walker is going to walk on the tight rope. And the, you know, the clowns are going to do what they do. You know, if you mix it all up, you put the clown tries to stick his mouth head in the lion's mouth, and the lion tamer is trying to walk the tightrope, and you know the the juggler is trying to lift up the heavy stuff that the strongman's doing. It's all out of sync. It's not working. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to have a scenario where you have Osprey and Ricochet do that thing, mm -hmm. cool. The next match following shouldn't do it. No other match on the card should do it. They got their their flavor. That's their vanilla. Now they're going to move on to chocolate, then pistachio, then Rocky Road, then strawberry. Finally, at the end of the night, they're going to get their chocolate chip cookie dough. As you can see, I'm a mark for ice cream. <laughs> but point being is um, it's a variety show, man. You don't I'll Put it this way. You don't want to see Andre the Giant and Big John Studd in match one. And then match two, we get Big John Studd or King Kong Bundy and L.A. Gante. In match three, we're going to get Vader and Bigelow. Those are all big guy matches. So if you have a big guy match, you have a tag match, you have a women's match, you have a midgets match, you have a, 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 a cruiserweight match where they're moving 100 miles an hour, that's cool because it's different. And everyone's going to get – you're going to see every different aspect of the wrestling and no two matches are going to be the same and everyone's still going to be invested in every match – as much as they were in the first match. Right. I mean, the WC, ECW, sorry to cut you off, ECW and WCW used to do this all the time. They used to put the cruiserweights on first because they would set the tone of the night mm -hmm. by all the high-flying stuff. And at the end of the night, you get the NWO coming into the ring and doing their deal with the horsemen and whoever else in WCW. You know, in ECW, they'd have all the, you know, Tajiri versus Super Crazy versus Guido versus, you know, the FBI versus, you know, Doring and Roadkill, whatever, night after night after night in different variations. But it's still told the same story. How many times are you going to see Mikey Whipwreck and Tajiri versus the FBI? A million times. Because every time they go out there, they're going to deliver. I mean, just, but and on the flip side, you have a John Cena Randy Orton match that two years that they, they've been on wrestling each other a million times on all the pay per views and all the roars and all that. Every match was amazing. But people yep. got tired of seeing it. You know what I mean? So there's a fine line when to, when's enough is enough. But in my opinion, there's room for everything. The fact is, you just got to know how to structure it. You structure a, a wrestling card like you structure a match, like you structure a promo, like you structure a movie. There's three acts in a movie. You right. don't start the movie in act three by telling everybody what happens and then work backwards to the origin story of how it got there. You start off at the beginning and you finish at the end at the high point, getting the story off across and paying everything off. Same thing with wrestling. Same thing with putting on a card. You have a card where you have 30,000 matches and all 30,000 matches. You have guys slapping their legs and doing dives and this, that, and the other and doing stunners and, you know, cutters and this, that. First time someone's going to see it, they're going to pop hard. Mm -hmm. By the third match, they've seen five or six, seven cutters. It's just another move. It's like a headlock. You're not going to get a reaction. Just my take. I don't know. What do I know, right? No, I mean, this is almost like if you do a table spot, in one match, there should never be no table spots for the rest of the night. I agree. I agree. You know what I mean, like, if, like seriously, because it's like you're going to desensitize the fan. Because if they, if the pop is going to happen when when the table spot happens, all right, cool, yeah, boom, power bomb through the table. But then in match six or seven, they're going to do another table spot in another match, and it's like, oh, we've seen this already. So it's yep. not going to be, the, the reaction is not going to be as great. Absolutely. You know, so. And this why if you ask why as a you know when you're a promoter again I'm I don't I've never experienced I don't have the experience of, of being a promoter but just watching wrestling as long as I have and being in the business for four years you're literally telling a story throughout the night for the fan the fan experience from match one to the very last one. Yep, without a doubt. Yeah, it's funny how you understand that, but some people who get in the ring don't understand that, and those people are the play wrestlers. They just go there and they slap in their legs and doing the flavor of the week and thinking they're over and drinking their own Kool-Aid and they're not. You know, at the end of the day, six months from now, if you're not on another show, no one's going to remember you. You know what I mean? The business will move on. But then you have certain individuals 
who test us, you know, who are legends and are withstanding the test of time because people believe in them, not what they did. Exactly. Well, I, again, it's been an honor and a, priv- and a privilege to have you on, you know, the show. Let the fans know where they can find you on social media, where they can find your website, you know, where they can get your merch, everything, the whole nine yards. All right. Okay, so you could find me at, at Greek God Papa Don on Twitter and Instagram um, and Getter, even though I don't go on Getter very often. Um, Demetrius Papa Don on Facebook. My YouTube channel is Greek God Papa Don. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, like, comment on the matches and the promos. The Pro Wrestling Tea Store is Pro Wrestling Tees slash Greek God Papa Don. Go buy your t shirts. The majority of them are. Are uh, designed by my boys Alex Arroyo and Spiro Antonopoulos. Those are my co-hosts to my podcasts. Um, I do. I am a big, as you can see in my background, I'm a big comic book Star Wars guy. Um, I do a Star Wars podcast called The New Force Order, the NFO. We stole the logo from the NWO because I'm an NWO mark, and put took out the W, put a big F in it, and it's the New Force Order. You can find us on all the platforms, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you look under your bed, you probably find us. Um, but you can find us all on social media at NFO underscore podcast, New Force Order on Instagram, and official New Force Order on Facebook. If you guys like it, give us a listen. Subscribe to the podcast. Give us like a five-star review, you know, comment, you know, give us – just, just this way, the algorithm could boost us up because I'm not gonna lie to you, the podcast is not very PC friendly. It's made for it's 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 made for everybody, not for kids. But you have two guys in their 40s talking about Star Wars and making comedy references and movie references and joke references that you and I would understand because we right. grew up in the same generation. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's not very snowflake or PC friendly, but you know what? Too bad. I think there's too many snowflakes and PC guys in safe spaces in this world that today, you know, but that's just my opinion. Um, I also do another podcast. We haven't done it in a while because we got shadow banned called the conspiracy horseman where it's myself, Bin Ha Min, Stevie Richards uh, from BWO fame and right to censor and uh, big Sal Graziano from the FBI uh, where we four wrestlers just talking about free thought, uh, always questioning narrative, what people call conspiracy theories. Uh, we were we had a hell of a run about three and a half years. We were talking to everybody, and, and uh, we even got on the you know, John McAfee was on a, on our show a few times. Um, David Ike, these are guys who are big conspiracy uh, guys who are in that genre. But we got shadow banned. It took us all off all the platforms around COVID time, and now we're trying to come back into it, trying to in sync all our busy schedules so we could start recording regularly. So catch that if it happens. And if you subscribe to any of my social media, I advertise all the time and, you know, I market myself all the time. So you'll see all the dates that I'm wrestling on and all the stuff that I'm doing via podcast. And uh, that's basically it, man. Well, again, Papa Don, like I said, I met you about 11 years ago, you know, when um, I started attending ECWA shows, you know, here in Delaware. And like I said, I believed in from the, from, from the, from the first time you walked through the, you know, through the, uh, through the aisle, I believed in the character right away and you've done a tremendous job over the years of staying out there staying active staying with it you inspire me to keep going you know like i said we're around the same you know same age and everything and we're still trying to chase the chase the dream and we're all going to get there man so again it's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show and you're a friend of the show forever so like i said i look forward to having you coming back someday, somewhere down the road absolutely man look good luck with this show I had a lot of fun tonight. Whenever you want me to come on, all you got to do is let me know and I'll be here. Um, Thank you for saying that I was an inspiration, man. That means a lot to me. It really, it really does. And I'm not me just saying that to say it. It really does. So thank you. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Good luck commentating in the super eight. Have a great time. Enjoy it. Continue the tradition of great talent that, that partake in that event. And uh, tell Ryan to uh, get in touch with me and book me so I can come back to ECWA. And maybe you could be ring announcing me. That'd be great, man. That'd be awesome. We got to share the ring, share the locker room. Absolutely, man. Definitely, man. Well, have a great time, man. And uh, thank you, man. You got it.
Well, that does it for this week's edition of the d Podcast. Again, I want to thank the Greek god Papa Don for coming on to the show to share his experiences and his opinions about, you know, the, the current state of the world of professional wrestling. And again, I wish him all the best what he continues to do with his career. And my hope is that he does, you know, get signed to a WWE or AEW or Impact Wrestling because there's definitely a place for someone like him that can hone his craft there for sure. Well, again... Make sure that you follow me on social media, okay? There's Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and TikTok at The Real DT Lou. Go into my YouTube channel, okay? You can look up Derek T. Lewis, The Real DT Lou, and make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel, all right? Speaking of subscribing, again, whichever platform that you're listening to this show on right now, make sure that you, you hit the subscribe button so every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, you're getting all new shows, okay? Make sure you don't miss out on that, okay? So I'm going to get out of here, and just remember, whatever it is that you do in life, always remember to make it count. Take care, guys. From amazing five-bedroom, two-story homes to beautiful two-bedrooms with office space, Celebrity Homes has the perfect home for you. Our homes come with amazing features, vaulted ceilings, sprinkler systems, quartz countertops, designer light packages, and more. Plus, Celebrity Homes is proud to offer our new exclusive closing package. Get a refrigerator, washer-dryer, garage door opener, instant access to Wi-Fi, professionally installed blinds, and up to $3,000 towards closing costs. Yes, it's all included. Visit CelebrityHomesOmaha.com today.